Hello. I've said previously that um, we humans are using too many resources on the planet Earth and um, in fact we're using about maybe three planets worth overall certainly two and a half um, and somebody suggested maybe I should do a video about how to reduce our ecological impact so this is it because it seems like a good idea to just go through it specifically um, on that issue and see what we can do. My, my bed is creaking here, maybe I should get a proper studio one day when I'm rich, eh? Um, actually, it probably I'm, I'm probably filming some awesome outdoor location actually um, when I'm rich, <laughs> which will, I don't know when that'll be. Um, when I've got a million subscribers, that'll be it, yeah. Um, so, what's the issue here? Uh, essentially, it's overpopulation. I mean, like in the 1800s, the population of the Earth was less than one billion people. And it had been ever since, well, forever, <laughs> basically. Naught to a billion, up to the 1800s. And now, seven and a half billion, something like that and counting. <clears throat> now it has to be said that this has not gone, gone unnoticed uh, by the ruling elites and it seems to me that they have come up with plans for how to deal with this <clears throat> and different plans have been tried. Um, the first to write about it that I know of was um, Thomas Malthus back in 1798 he did an essay on population and what he found uh, or what he thought I mean I don't know how much he did some research on it um, but his conclusion was that when people's uh, standard of living rises and they, or they get access to more resources what happens is the population increases so that instead of the extra resources going to improve their standard of living in the long run, they just increase the number of people. So the standard of living ends up being low again. And ultimately you would end up with a what's known as a Malthusian catastrophe, where population increases to the point where it's completely unsustainable and it will then collapse into a <coughs> disaster maybe a, a drop back to the Stone Age or worse, war for resources, that sort of thing. Um, indeed, the Bronze Age civilization, when it ran out of tin, um, did collapse, and around the Mediterranean you had 300 years worth of constant war between the various remains of the civilizations fighting each other until somebody discovered how to smelt iron. Um, so it's happened before. Uh, if it happens now it will be probably much worse because the war will not be fought with swords and spears this time. <clears throat> um, so we don't want that to happen because it's a bit too risky. So that was 1798. Um, war for resources then would have been survivable um, but not anymore. So there are plans for how to help people cut their resource use and how to cut the population overall with time. Um, and you'll see lots of conspiracy theory videos about it. I think whether it's a conspiracy or not, um, there clearly is some manipulation or work, if you like, going on. Um, and there are things we can do as individuals, which I'm going to talk about in this video, to cut our own ecological footprint. Um, but I do want to look at the society-wide move, moves, you know, I suppose, that are, that are being made first. Um, <clears throat> and looking at it society-wide, there, there have been two main strands uh, which have been written about and tried. 
Uh, one is written about in George Orwell's 1984 book. It's the path of um, an in-your-face dictatorship, basically. And the other one is talked about in Aldous Huxley's book, Brave New World, which is not in your face. It's a dictatorship of sorts. It's using drugs and gimmicks and entertainment to keep people pacified whilst things are manipulated in the background. That's the system we use in the West, it appears. <clears throat> so if you want to see how it works, get Aldous Huxley's book, <laughs> Brave New World. Okay, I'll put a link to it. Um, now, 1984, the dictatorship method, uh, I mean, when George Orwell wrote his book, way back when, it was written as a parody, really, of the USSR, um, Soviet Russia. Um, and I think it was like, you know, all, all people are created equal, but some are more equal than others. Um, Everything is done for the state. Um, the system had its problems, let's say. Um, like mass murder of the population by the rulers. Um, in fact, mass enslavement of large numbers of the populations who are stuck in gulags really just to do work for the state, for free. Um, and they weren't treated well and they, they died in their millions. Um, mass pollution. Um, supposedly everything is being done for the good of the world and, and the people, but actually it was done in a very poor way. And even China, which has adjusted their system, still pollutes like crazy, although they're, they're working on it, though. Um, it also resulted in economic stagnation and technological stagnation. They were able to, with an effort, keep up with the West. They were even ahead of the West in the 50s, um, but they weren't able to keep it up. Um, and really, the system was a grim disaster, mass starvation as well in, in Russia. In China, <clears throat> they managed to feed everybody. Um, I think that's partly down to the Chinese psyche. They've, they've had thousands of years of, or at least a thousand years of feudalism. Um, the people were used to being controlled by the rulers, um, if you like. Um, they were more <clears throat> united in their approach. Um, but still, 20 odd million killed during the, uh, uh, whatever it was, revolution, um, cultural revolution. Um, and they were not really able to keep up with the West at all. So <clears throat> both major attempts kind of failed at that approach. People don't work well with an in-your-face dictatorship, <clears throat> let's face it. I mean, in the end, the Russian people brought down their system, essentially, by getting drunk and doing their work badly. After a couple of generations of that, no system can survive. OK, <clears throat> it worked. So if you're in an in-your-face dictatorship, that is the best thing to do for humanity. Do your work badly. Be stupid. Act stupid. OK, get drunk all the time. Don't contribute to society. Just... After a couple of generations, it'll fall over, right? They always do. So, plus, of course, the dictators eventually die and are replaced by people who are more reasonable in the end, like Gorbachev, um, for example. Um, China's experimenting with a new version of that system, one which is uh, one country, two systems. So they're allowing capitalism now, as long as you keep your nose out of politics. Plus, they've kind of made their political system responsive so that it's OK to complain to the state now. You're not going to get thrown into a gulag anymore unless you're outright disloyal. OK, you can you can moan and say, oh, this isn't working. Can we do something about this? And they'll actually try and listen. Um, so it's it's an experiment with a, a softer form of dictatorship, if you like, um, a responsive dictatorship. Um, 
It remains to be seen how it works out. They have a huge trade surplus. What will they do when their customers go bankrupt? They'll crash as well. Um, can they survive it with their system? We don't know. But it's an experiment that's going on and it's being managed by the ruling elites, right? Um, that's what they want, apparently. Um, so, what about Huxley's method? Um, Brave New World. Keep the people pacified with drugs, um, pornography, um, entertainment of all sorts, basically, uh, while the rulers get on and do what they like. Uh, even fake news, right, is entertainment, basically, these days, because most of the news that we see is rubbish. I mean, it's semi-true as far as it goes, but not worth knowing. Um, I don't know, I tune into Google, Google News every now and then to see what's there, but really, it's dull stuff. I don't need to know it, really. Um, and why should I stress myself out about all the stuff that's happening? There's good news too, and it's hardly reported. It's, it's meant to keep us a bit fearful, I think. Um, this system has its own problems. Uh, it's prone to starting wars rather a lot uh, in order to manage control of resources um, and <clears throat> overproduction, massive overproduction. It's, everything's done for profit directly. Uh, in the like the Russian dictatorship, it was very much done for profit, but profit for the state. Um, in the Western system, it's private profit. But it does lead to massive overproduction, as, as we know. Um, and it leads to terrible food being supplied to people, um, cities being designed for uh, to enhance the use of motor cars, um, all sorts of unintelligent but short-term advantageous steps. So... <clears throat> It's more efficient economically, except when it crashes, um, and it's more efficient technologically as well. I think research does go better under this system. An extreme variant of it was tried under fascism in World War II, uh, but that was way too warlike okay, and destructive. Um, we have a kind of a reverse fascism in countries now where the corporations control the state, um, pretty much um, it leaves the elite in control and the state as kind of a puppets under them there, there, there's, there's, there's some play back and forth but it's kind of kind of like that it's it's at least anyway it's not an in your face dictatorship so it's, it's better for that um, if you want to see how the brave new world system is Done. You can read his book, of course, to see the, the, the original theory, if you like. Um, but you can find, with difficulty online, <coughs> um, Adam Curtis's documentary, four episodes, uh, The Century of the Self, talking about the 20th century. Um, <coughs> you can get it on archive.org for free, sometime, usually. Uh, sometimes on YouTube, you just have to... Uh, they keep deleting it, of course, because it's copyright. Um, but you can usually find some of it there. <laughs> um, and as we live in the West, me and most of my viewers, um, I'll talk about that a bit more. I think the the communist dictatorship system is, is effectively over with. I mean, even the Chinese system is, is not as in your face as, as you know the old system. Um, it's a kind of an in-betweeny system and we don't know what's going to be settled on by the rulers but unless we reduce our footprint they might have to try more drastic measures because population does have to be controlled because the earth cannot support um, uncontrolled population growth the projections are that it's going to peak at between 9 and 11.5 billion and then start declining. 
already the growth rate of population is down. It peaked in the 1960s, towards the end of the 1960s, and growth is slower, but it's still positive. Um, so it's sort of the curve is flattening out a bit now. Um, next generation, India's population will probably peak, and the generation after that, or India and Southeast Asia population will, is, is projected to, to peak and then start dropping, and then uh, in the generation after that, Africa's population is expected to peak and then start dropping. And so exactly where it hap where it does so is why we have a, a spread of guesses at between 9 and 11 and a half billion or so, maybe 12. Um, that will be a struggle to support, but it's just about doable with genetically modified food and if we do our bit. Um, the plan for the West in particular is written out in the United Nations Agenda 21 and Agenda 30, um, which I've skim read but not read fully because it's dull. Um, but the idea is everybody will be moved in the West, anyway, moved into or encouraged to go and live in big cities, in micro homes which are basically small apartments. Um, there'll be rewilding going on in the wilderness as people are moved off the land a bit by bit, usually by economic pressures and complicated regulations which are too expensive so it's not profitable to work, small, small holdings and stuff. Um, by giving people less disposable income. Um, disposable income for the working classes has been flatlining uh, maybe declining a bit since the 70s. Um, through the education of women um, and through better health care. Um, and perhaps through more surveillance and AI control in the future. But all of these things lead to fewer children and the populations of the, of the native Westerners are in decline um, pretty much everywhere. Um, I think France is still growing a bit, but that's it. Uh, the reason educating women and better health care results in fewer children is because, as it is in Africa still, you have to have many children in order to, to ensure some survive to, to look after you in your own, own old age, um, because the death rate is too high of children. So you have lots of children and usually three or four survive, something like that, out of maybe eight. Um, so with better health care, if those children survive, then they realise they don't have to have so many children. Furthermore, educated women realise that it's not in their interest to be a baby factory, right? So those two factors work together to, over a generation or two, reduce the birth rate to slightly below the replacement rate and the pressure comes off so that's why it's thought all these vaccines that Bill Gates is so keen on will work um, because it's stopping children from dying um, and I know the conspiracy theorists say he's up to something it's cobblers that there's, there's there's sound science behind it okay um, Micro homes, they're definitely building them. I mean, homes in the UK are on the small side compared with the rest of Europe already. Um, but I've been to look at new build show homes, so-called luxury apartments, and, as they call them, and, and stupid names like that. Um, and they are indeed small. And in fact, they lack storage space as well. So people are going to be encouraged, clearly, to not buy physical junk, they'll be spending their money on digital junk instead, presumably, which is good for the environment. But you see how it's being done by manipulation rather than by training people directly. I think because the majority of the population really are unconscionably selfish, actually, and most people, when you look at people out in the world, they are 
very, very selfish in the way they behave. I mean, in the United States alone, three billion Starbucks coffee cups are disposed of in the streets every year. I mean, they can't even be bothered to bin them or recycle them, okay? Um, and that's just the coffee cups, okay? I mean, there's litter all over the place when you look around. Um, wastage, stuff not being recycled, people leaving their lights on and leaving their cars running and, and all the rest of it, you know. Um, I'm going to go through various things we as individuals, if we want to, can do fairly easily. Um, with, I mean, it, it'll take a bit of strain, but it's not that tough. Um, but there's no doubt that the micro apartments or micro homes are being built. Um, and part of the way this is being done is by boosting the prices of property and allowing it to rise and rise and rise. Um, while saying, oh dear, there's a property price crisis, not enough new homes are being built. Um, but um, things could be done, but it's not in the elite's best interests to do so, as they're typically property, property owners and they want the prices to rise. And anyway, for control of the population, it's better if they're in small homes. Small homes also reduce the birth rate, as does the decline in disposable income, because families put off having children uh, if their accommodation is unsuitable for them and if um, they don't quite have enough money. So the result is net fewer children. Um, it's subtle, but it's it's definitely working. Um, when I was married, we were putting off having children for both those reasons, actually. Um, now I'm divorced, it's just as well we did, I think. But anyway. So the next question is, with so many people being selfish and most people really not doing a thing and just unconsciously consuming and chucking stuff away and, and being wasteful, why should I do anything when, when nearly everybody else is, is a slob, basically? Um, well, the way I think of it is, is that you are responsible, or I am responsible, only for what I do. What other people do is up to them. And if enough of us feel the same way, then we might just make some difference and less drastic solutions will be required over time to fix the problem. See, if nothing is done about the population problem, I think it is being done, but if nothing were done, uh, projections are that the population would reach about 36 to 38 billion within one or two centuries, and then population would obviously crash in a disaster of Malthusian proportions. Um, in fact, it would probably be a fatal nuclear war, basically. Um, but there would certainly be mass starvation and scrambling for resources, um, and nuclear weapons would obviously be used, or worse, whatever's around at the time. Um, AI warriors going rampage like Terminator, you know, something like that. So we don't want that. So something is being done, um, and we can soften the impact through our own actions. Um, a second point is you will actually save money anyway. So first of all, you're responsible for what you do, as am I. And in saving the environment, you also mostly or save money. Not entirely. The, the saving of money is not an exact proxy for saving the environment, because some things are more expensive to do. Um, but it's a rough guide. Um, so with your energy tr consumption and, and transport and stuff like that, for instance, you save money at the same time. So, with that, what do you do? Well, the number one problem is food, I think. Um, we in the West eat a lot of meat, but it is well known that it's more efficient to grow vegetables 
it uses less farmland <coughs> per calorie, basically. So we should really be vegetarian or at least vegan. Now, I'm not going to be vegetarian or vegan, probably ever. Um, despite the fact that another reason for doing it is it results in less cruelty to animals. I would hope that we come up with a way of growing meat in vats, basically, so we don't have to be cruel to animals. Um, I don't like it and I um, would really like to avoid it, but vegetables suck, let's face it. I know the advocates say, oh no, you can make delicious meals. Well, I can't, okay, um, and I don't have the time. And it is actually more expensive. Um, I could grow my own if I had a garden, but I'm in a micro apartment, kind of, um, and I don't have a garden. I might be able to get a window box up, and that's, it's not a big deal, you know. That's like a few trips to the supermarket and it's covered. I don't know. Um, the vegetable food tends to be too carbohydrate rich as well. <clears throat> not always, but often. Um, and it's heavily processed, so I'm not convinced it's good for you anyway. Um, see, a lot of people are diabetic these days, and carbohydrate rich foods are a problem for them. Uh, a lot of the root vegetables in particular are, are not healthy, therefore, for such people. Um, there are questions over the health benefits of vegetarian, of strictly vegetarian diets anyway. Uh, we probably should be eating less meat, and it probably is worth having like a meatless Monday or a, a fish Friday, something of that sort, just to get into the habit of eating less. Um, and that's something which probably can be done without too much effort. It'll take a bit of thinking about it first if you're not used to doing it. Um, but you can get somewhere. And that includes dairy, like eggs and milk, because they involve animals and animal cruelty and so on. Um, and, of course, there's the waste food, which you don't eat but throw away. I think in Britain something like a third of all food purchased is thrown away. That's a lot. Um, there's the packaging. We should be buying fresh, unpackaged fruit and vegetables. And we should encourage the supermarkets to stock that stuff by buying it and not buying the other stuff. Um, but it's difficult. And the same with ready meals as well. That They're very, very inefficient ecologically and some of the packaging is not even recyclable um, and that's true on a lot of things that even claim to be healthy like I don't know soya milk cartons and stuff they have a layer of plastic inside in the old days they used wax which was natural nowadays they have plastic so toxins are probably leaching into your food anyway um, what can you do about it not much um, At the moment, at the organic food aisles, the stuff is too expensive um, because I suppose there's not enough demand, but also organic food is, is less efficient to grow than the mass-produced stuff. But the mass-produced stuff is still more efficient than producing meat. So that's the first thing. At least cut it down a bit. Think about the animals. Um, admittedly, if we do cut it out altogether, the, the animals will probably go extinct or be stuck to, stuck in some single nature reserve somewhere. Um, but with the Agenda 21 rewilding going on, maybe they can be given some decent habitat somewhere after, a, within the next century anyway. The next thing we can do is heating and air conditioning. In a cold country like Britain, <coughs> A lot of people put the heating on and they keep their rooms stifling hot, their houses. Um, and they walk around in t-shirts. This is ridiculous and it's such a waste of money. Okay. All you should use the heating for, I suggest, is just to keep the chill off the place. Then you could just put a jumper on, right? One extra layer or maybe two extra layers if you like. A polyester t-shirt against your, against your skin, a shirt or something for a man. And a, and a, a jumper and 
maybe if you're prone to cold feet, two pairs of socks. That does that does actually work. Okay. What's the big deal? Why keep the place hot and spend double or triple the money heating your home? The same goes for air conditioning. You don't need to keep the place cool just to keep the worst of the heat off. Now, with heat, if the temperature gets above 35 Celsius centigrade, that is 95 Fahrenheit, while humidity is above 85%, that can be fatal for humans if they're exposed to it for more than six hours. People start to die above those temperatures. Um, so use your air conditioning to keep it, say, below 30 degrees. Minim minimise the, the effort, basically. Um, incidentally, um, if you're sitting outdoors trying to keep cool, <clears throat> it's more efficient to sit under a tree than it is to sit under a canopy or an umbrella or parasol or whatever. Because <clears throat> um, a canopy of some sort, it absorbs the heat and blocks the direct sunlight, but it also re-radiates the heat as well, all of it, in the end. So it's it's only blocking the direct sunlight to a certain extent. You know, that's, that's really the only benefit you're getting. Under a tree, it does the same, except that it, it the tree also absorbs some of the energy and uses it to make more tree. It's growing, right? It's a plant. So not all of the energy gets re-radiated. And it's a little bit cooler under a tree than it is under a canopy. Um, just so you know. Um, so one thing I do, like in the real depths of winter in Britain, it gets to around about, you know, zero-ish, typically. Okay, Celsius, 32 Fahrenheit. That's like a not untypical winter temperature, cold winter temperature. Um, when it's cold like that, you still don't need the heating on all the time. You certainly don't need it on when you're not in. Okay. Um, what you can do is have it on for like, if you've got a little time switch on it, you can have it on for like 15 minutes every hour while you're in. And maybe it has to be on for half an hour at first just to, to warm the place up at first. And then off, off, on for a quarter of an hour on for a quarter of an hour, like that, throughout the evening, and that keeps the chill off the place quite adequately. When the weather's really cold, you might have to do more than that. But I still have never found a time when I've needed the heat on all the time throughout an evening. Um, and this place, which is landlord owned, is, is not well insulated at all. There's no incentive for the landlord to insulate the place because he's not paying the electricity bills um, and he also doesn't care about the environment so he's happy for us to waste it but anyway the upshot is I don't need the heating on all the time I can put on an extra layer or two and I can just have the heating on just enough to keep the chill off and that's plenty it I don't feel cold um, you do adapt to the winter a bit anyway, so take advantage of that. The other thing you can do is transport. Do you need a big gas guzzling car, really? Can you walk? Can you take the bus? Can you take a train? Now this is particularly difficult in the USA and particularly easy in London. <laughs> Okay. Um, in the USA, the cities were deliberately designed uh, with consultation with the car companies to make people buy and use cars because they are sprawling all over the place. There's no real concentrations of little townships, as it were, in a lot of the cities. Um, so car use was stupidly encouraged by capitalism. Right. Um, and the public transport system is pretty poor in a lot of places too. Um, but could you get by with a, a lesser car? If you're single, couldn't you use like a, a motor scooter or something if you have to travel a lot? Or a motorbike? Um, this is culturally tough in the USA, I know. It's actually culturally tough in Britain too. 
I mean, living in London, London developed from villages, so there are clusters of little mini towns within London, and they are connected by tube lines, the underground system, mass transit. And the buses are very, very frequent because there's so many people using them, and again, they connect the main places quite well. Um, all the high streets get connected up. It's it's easy here. I mean, I'm in a suburb here, and there are multiple bus routes which can take me all over the place within a two minute walk from my front door. If I want to go to some other buses, there are buses eight minutes away. It's just down the road. Um, if you must have a car, you might consider not replacing it every three years with a new one. It's only status. It, it still works, doesn't it? If you get a really, really old car before they had computer chips in them, it may be less efficient fuel-wise, but you can maintain it yourself without having to have a vast whole new car made all the time. You can learn to be a mechanic. People enjoy it. Fixing the old car up, you know? That can be done. You could even get an old antique car. Uh, some sort of um, special car if you want to spend some money on it. Again, the fuel efficiency is not going to be great, but you're not getting a factory to replace this thing every three or four years. And you could even use taxis if you don't want to do that. If you, if you could, for example, if you buy a new car, whenever you buy a brand new car, it depreciates in value immediately by a few thousand straight away and then you've got the cost of ownership on top of that and if you're replacing it every few years if you divide that cost out I've done it the calculation for myself and it works out that actually I could afford 200 short taxi journeys for the cost of owning a car for a year that is for several years but divided down yearly by short taxi journeys I mean um, a few miles. So I think it was 10, something like that. Um, so consider using taxis. Remember with driverless cars coming along it may be that taxis will be cheaper too because they won't have to pay the drivers. Um, seems like a good idea to me unless you're a driver <laughs> bottled water forget it just get a water filter and fill up your own bottles with it and take them uh, you can buy bottles with filters built in I don't know how good they are we can get a jug with a filter and just use that um, there's one recommendation that a lot of people make, which is put a brick in your toilet to reduce the amount of water used in a flush. I disagree with that. Um, it's not hygienic. The thing is, a full 9 litre flush, which is a full tank, after a full 9 litre flush, typically there are about 20 bacteria per cubic centimetre in the water that's left in the bowl. If you put a brick in, which is about 1.5 litres volume, so you're having a seven and a half litre flush. After that flush, there's about one million bacteria per cubic centimetre. And if you go to the extreme and put two bricks in, there's about 20 million bacteria per cubic centimetre. So this is, I think this is dangerous and shouldn't be done, um, basically. It's, it's advice where people are not thinking about the consequences. So do flush the toilet properly. Um, dishwashers don't use them that's it, get rid of it, sell it um, washing machines or clothes dryers don't if, don't use the drying cycle just hang them up on a, on a clothes horse it's not difficult if you've got a garden put a line out and put them, put them out there even in the winter clothes do dry especially if you've got a rack indoors 
Um, you may have to find some corner to put it if you're in a micro home, but you save a lot of electricity by not using the dryer. And for the wash, for most washes, use the coolest wash the machine allows. And there are powders and whatnot designed for cool washes. Um, I think every now and then you do have to do a hotter wash, just to be sure. Um, but just make most of them cool washes. Um, or even cold washes. You'll save a lot. Um, plastic bags, like for shopping and stuff, don't use them. Buy, you can buy fold-up cloth bags, ones which fold up very compact, like th this size and flat, which will fit in a pocket or something or in a bag easily. Just carry a couple of them with you all the time. Um, you can get them on eBay and wherever. Uh, there are lots that fold up and are not that compact, but there are. If you look around, there are some which are, which fold up to be very very small. Um, use them. And recycle stuff. Don't just chuck it away in in the, in the streets or somewhere. Put it in recycle bins. I notice even in McDonald's where they have recycle bins, people still chuck their rubbish in the main bin without even looking at the recycle bins. They've got a place for cups, a place for the plastic bits. Most people ignore them or they stick their cups in, their paper cups in the plastic bits recycling bin because they're stupid or something, I don't know. But those are the main things. Um, cut down on meat a bit, if it's painful perhaps, but do, do it some. Um, and control the heating and the air conditioning and your general expenditure because your expenditure is a rough proxy for saving the planet. Um, as I say, it's rough because you can buy digital products without doing much harm. Um, and organic vegetables actually cost you more. Um, public transport should be cheaper than owning a car in most cases um, by quite a lot. And you might say, oh, well, I have to, it's a mile to, the, to wherever I've got to go. A mile is not too far to walk but you might be short of time and you have to work out what suits you and what's doable and what isn't. Um, but the more we do, the less drastic the final solutions have to be. Um, I'll put some links to these footprint calculators in the description below uh, on YouTube. Um, they're a bit vague. I did one specifically from the Worldwide Fund for Nature WWF, which were designed for the UK, and it showed my footprint was 0.9 planets I need to support my lifestyle. But then I did one um, which looked like it was USA based, and that told me I needed 3.5 planets for my lifestyle. <laughs> so they can vary a lot. But I think the USA one was probably assuming a USA lifestyle, big portions and all the rest of it. Um, but the Worldwide Fund for Nature, I couldn't find a USA a footprint calculator there. They have them for the Netherlands and India. Couldn't find a USA one. Um, but maybe if you go on it from the USA it'll project one to you, I don't know. Anyway, the links are there. And links to um, the century of the self. You really do need to look at that and see how the population is being controlled in the West. I mean, it's okay. Most people are unconscious and unaware of how they're being manipulated, despite all the conspiracy videos online showing you exactly what's happening uh, and taking it too far in many cases. Um, but yeah, if, if you and I do our bit, well maybe things will be better and at least we'll save some money. So do you agree? Do you disagree? Um, do you have any ideas? or thoughts about what I might have missed out. Uh, there are lots of sites offering little tips and things. You just have to think, well, is this feasible for me or not? And probably if you try to do it all at once, you'll forget half of them and fail, I don't know. But you can always implement like one a month or something, I don't know. I would say turn the heating down right away or the air conditioning. It does not need to be on full blast, it's ridiculous. It's your money down the drain, but it's also the planet. Anyway,
Bye for now.